Here we go. Uh, yes. Here we go live. Yeah. Look at We are live? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome in the session on catafitic and agrochemicals. Uh, my name is Sukash Wojniacki. I am representing European Crop Protection Association and together with uh, Ellen Tevison from Philip Morris, uh, we'll be talking about catafitting and, and uh, what industry is doing because indeed it's an industry-wide uh, problem. Uh, Ellen is working for Philip Morris for over 20 years and in her faction she's responsible for the fight about uh, against uh, illicit trade in tobacco products. Uh, so I give floor uh, to Ellen, uh, then um, I will also talk about pesticides and we'll have a Q&A session uh, um, till the end of the uh, uh, our panel. Um, Ellen? Thank you very much, Lucas. I have a horrible echo on the line. I hope that the audience is not having the same. I hear you properly. Um, Uh, we can hear you properly. We can hear you both of you. Okay, so it's only me then. Yeah, yeah we can hear you properly. Okay. So you, you're able to see my slides, I assume? Yes, yes. yes. Perfect. Yes. So thank you very much, Lucas, and thank you to all of you for having me in this uh, in this forum today. Just a little bit of a PMI. Uh, PMI Philip Morris International is a company that um, uh, is present in around 180 countries. Uh, 77,000 people are employed uh, by Philip Morris International. And the most known brands that we have are, uh, as you know, Marlboro, LM, and ICOS. So, um, Lucas, as you mentioned, indeed, also PMI is fighting the smuggling and the counterfeiting of our product, and that's then mainly Marlboro. And to give you a little bit of better idea of the size of the illicit trade, I would like to share some basic numbers with you. I will not go into detail, but I just want to sketch a little bit, frame a little bit the, 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 the topic that we're talking about. In 2019, almost 40 billion illegal cigarettes were consumed in the EU. 40 billion is around 8% of the total EU cigarettes consumption. So that means that almost one out of 10 consumed cigarettes were illegal. You, you might know or you might not know, there are different variances in illicit trade, uh, such as you have the contraband, you have the counterfeit, and you have illicit whites. And if we look at counterfeit as such, what we are talking here about today, that is the variant that is increasing, increasing in 18 EU countries today. 7.6 billion counterfeit cigarettes are consumed in 2019, which is an increase of almost 40% versus 2018. But what, what are now, for instance, the consequences of illicit trade? Um, illicit trade has important societal consequences, which I don't want to go too much into de de detail, but just as an explanation, by providing a cheap and an unregulated supply of tobacco and nicotine products, illicit trade undermines all the global efforts that are being taken to reduce the smoking prevalence and also to prevent youth initiation. That's one hand side. On the other hand side, it also has serious consequences for consumers, particularly due to the low um, standards of quality and the reliability of counterfeit products. Our products, PMI products, are produced under very strict regulations and quality standards, which is, of course, not the case with counterfeit products as they are produced in illegal factories. And these illegal factories are not anymore, as we know from the past in China or in Eastern Europe or whatever. They're here. They're closer by than that we think. I am Belgium. And uh, we, I mean, this year, there were already seven illegal tobacco and water pipe tobacco um, illegal factories found in, in, in my country, in our country. So that is, uh, that is tremendous. For society at large, it's also, there's also a large consequence because illicit trade is an obstacle to sustainable development. 
with the loss of government revenue um, and um, the uh, revenue loss of 2019 is 9.5 billion euro due to tax loss. And this amount of money could be spent on um, public services infrastructure around the world. And especially in these timings like COVID, I think everybody is aware that these funds, this, this kind of um, amount can be used for other um, uh, destinations. Furthermore, illicit trade involves extensive corruption and is part of a wider system of um, illegal activities, finance transnational criminal organizations, and threatening human rights and damaging, of course, our environment. So it is, uh, it's a little bit as up to us in collaboration with a lot of stakeholders uh, to fight against counterfeit and smuggling of our products. And we do that on different levels, going from the consumer to the distribution to law enforcement. How do we concretely do that? That's one, consumer awareness. I think it's very clear that if your consumer is aware of what is going on, that they will also think twice before they buy an illegal cigarette. The second thing is the implementation of Article 15 and 16 of the TPD, the tracking and tracing, which means that every product has now a unique code which can be tracked from production to final destination. The third point is that this is a fight that we cannot do by ourselves. It's a fight that where we collaborate and cooperate with law enforcement and we support the authorities' efforts to, first of all, find, to track down, to confiscate and to destroy illicit tobacco products. And then last but definitely not least, uh, it's all about intelligence sharing by monitoring the trends of illicit trade tobacco through research. And to give you a very clear example where we're also talking about today is about online sales. And especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, consumer has ramped up their activities on the digital sphere. PMI has implemented several measures to address the challenges on, on online trade, including through collaboration with online platforms, intermediaries, brand alliances, and set, et cetera, et cetera. There are multiple stakeholders in this story. And in this regard, PMI is one of the voluntary signatories of the Memorandum of Understanding of the sale of counterfeit goods via the internet, facilitated by the Commission, and talked about this morning by uh, Angelique Moneret. So as you can understand, PMI puts a lot, a lot of focus on the fight against illicit trade, but also you can imagine that this is a fight that we cannot win uh, alone. We are in it with different stakeholders and we all have the same objective. So together, private companies, public awareness, we can tackle this crime. Thank you very much, um, Lucas uh, and the audience, and feel free to ask any questions you have. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and we have uh, our first speaker who, who joined, uh, Evelyn uh, Lucinaka. Uh, she's from Copyright Africa, Africa and Middle East. Uh, she will speak. Uh, welcome, Evelyn. She will speak uh, just after me. Uh, and uh, now it's time for my presentation. And uh, let me just go. Okay, um, I want you to talk about counterfeit illegal pesticides and present you the, uh, the problems uh, that we have. Um, but first, the uh, European Crop Protection Association is an association of companies uh, and associations, national associations, uh, producing uh, pesticides, uh, both uh, big uh, and SME companies uh, are represented by our association, Syngenta, BSF, uh, uh, Bayer. Sorry. Problem of counterfeit illegal pesticides. Uh, it's estimated that it's around 14% of, uh, of the EU, uh, EU market. And why it's a, such, a big, uh, such a big problem? Uh, because similar to, to tobacco products, pesticides uh, are very strictly regulated. There are more than 100 safety tests that a product has to undergo before being put on the market. The risk and benefits are documented, understood. There are EU agencies, European Commission member states involved in the authorization. 
You have suppliers that are committed to providing high quality products and uh, also conduct stewardship support. On the other hand, you have counterfeit and legal pesticides which are untested. There might be soap with water, but there might be some dangerous chemicals that could potentially destroy a farm, a farm uh, endanger a uh, farmer's health. And you have suppliers, uh, criminals who just uh, care about money and no stewardship activities, unknown to authorities, and often this money goes to other illegal uh, activities. So what is the, uh, sorry, uh, one more slide before uh, ECPA uh, response. Uh, so we are talking about danger to farmers. We're talking about uh, danger to, uh, to farms, uh, but it's also uh, a loss for economy. 238 million euro lost annually in only in the EU in lost government revenue. There's also direct job losses, indirect, and loss, of course, for the for the industry. So, what is the response from the industry? Uh, well, training farmers, working with everybody. We have trained 100,000 farmers in the last two years. Those are data for 2017 and 18. But we also continue our activities even now in COVID times. We do online training. We do videos. So we try to reach as much uh, as many farmers as possible. We're working with customs with law enforcement. Um, and we have a, a communication campaign in a number of countries, examples from Poland, Bulgaria, from Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, where we run, uh, when we uh, produce posters, leaflets, videos, articles, uh, uh, interviews in printed and uh, online uh, media. And I wanted to highlight one activity because the, the conference is about innovation. So we cooperate with internet influencers. Here are examples, YouTubers, uh, young YouTubers, uh, farmers from Poland. Uh, thanks to cooperating with them, the videos about risk of illegal counterfeit pesticides uh, reach uh, more than 300,000 uh, viewers. So they're uh, on YouTube uh, only. There were also uh, views on, on Facebook. Uh, we also continue cooperation with, with Olaf, with Europol, Operation Silver Axe against counterfeit and legal pesticides, where we share intelligence uh, with the law enforcement to improve the fight against counterfeit pesticides. Those are only a few examples of a number of activities that we do as industry associations and companies all together. What I want to uh, give you as a main message is that we have to work together, all together, to fight this big problem uh, because it's a big problem that endanger and danger the whole uh, society. And having said that, uh, I will uh, now uh, give slides to uh, Evelyn, uh, and uh, um, the floor is yours, Evelyn. Evelyn. Okay, uh, Evelyn, do you hear? Sorry, you can hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, I'm trying to see if I could share my screen and... Um, okay, we are here, we are. So, just a bit, uh, just like uh, how uh, Lucas has given the, a brief introduction about uh, ECPA, CropLife Africa Middle East uh, is a member of CropLife International. We have 26 national associations in Africa and Middle East representing the pesticide uh, industry. And also we have, a part of our membership, we have the leading R&D companies from the, uh, that includes uh, BSF, Bayer, and all the companies that you see below there. When it comes to counterfeit, Africa uh, counterfeit is a big challenge. 
We have seen um, many uh, emerging, especially during this pandemic and also during crisis, emerging of counterfeits. Uh, but what makes uh, counterfeit very significant in Africa is policies and regulations which are very weak that do not support enforcement of anti-counterfeit procedures. And we have seen that countries, most countries are moving towards coming up with uh, strong enforcement uh, policies and regulations that can be able to deter counterfeit. And for Crop Life Africa Middle East, our strategic priorities when it comes to counterfeit, we are looking at, uh, as I've said, upgrading the national and regional frameworks to international standards. As I've said, regulations and policies that re really regards counterfeit in different countries are very, very weak. And we, uh, through our advocacy and regulatory uh, committees, we're trying to work with the different counterfeit agencies in the different countries to make sure that they can come up with very strong uh, deterrent uh, policies and regulations. And as you can see from this slide, we find that most countries do not have, even if they have existing regulations in the countries, the penalties are very weak and um, the enforcement is very, very weak due to constraints of staff or the resources that can be able to deter counterfeit. What is unique about Africa is that most of the counterfeit is locally manufactured, I put that in quotes, rather than coming from countries such as China and all uh, and the other countries from far. But we see that we are starting to get a lot of technology uh, transfer on from the counterfeiters on how to make sure that the counterfeits look almost like the real product. And um, we're looking at uh, labels which look very similar, making it even very difficult for the owner of the products to come up with or to be able to identify the products we have looked at people making similar almost similar labels and uh confusing labels that can be, uh, has given the farmers uh, a big problem in terms of identification of the counterfeit we are also seeing uh emergence of new markets for counterfeits as i've said maybe from china and uh mostly which are also uh, a big problem that is coming up in Africa because we're seeing a big uh, market of the, of the emerging market or um, uh, influx of the Chinese into the African market of lead. So when we look at this, different countries have been able to do different studies of counterfeit. And on average in Africa, for example, in Kenya, they did um, a study to, to be able to determine the level of counterfeiting, for example, in Kenya, they found that it was around 18%. But in general, in Africa, the counterfeiting levels ranges between 15 to 30%. And even sometimes in other countries, it might go even higher. And um, when we look at this, we find that the risks of the counterfeit are really dire because Africa is a, country, is a continent that really relies on agriculture for uh, food and uh, for its GDP. And so the, uh, the effects of the counterfeits are really, really dire in the continent. And what are we looking at this? Or what is our strategy, especially when it comes to counterfeit? We are looking at awareness creation, capacity building. We are doing a lot of capacity building to law enforcers and customs officials, and also looking at strengthening advocacy around uh, strengthening the policies and regulations in terms of counterfeit. And one of the things that we have worked on is to, and to support the regulators or to support the enforcement agencies to be able to get uh, or to be able to arrest some of the, uh, the counterfeiters. But this has been proved to be a bit difficult or challenging because of the penalties that are result as a result of that. So what we're looking at, uh, at the end of this world, we're looking at appropriation by the countries, institutionalization of the fight uh, and effective enforcement of laws, deterrent measures. We're looking at the anti-fraud procedures, inspection controls, strengthening inspection and controls, raids and seizures and disposals or at or offenders' costs. And we're looking at co cooperation and agencies, especially with enforcement bodies, and as I've talked, the customs, the police, and the security offices. As Crop Life AME, we have come up with uh, systems where we are training the customs and the police and the enforcement agencies in the different countries. 
We're also looking at regional cooperation, regulatory bodies, and looking at uh, strengthening also counterfeiters around the regional economic uh, bodies, for example, the SADAC or the East African community. And also we are moving towards alliances with the industry, food industry producers, and the commodity exporters, especially in, in terms of where they access the products. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Evelyn, for the presentation. Uh, we have uh, six minutes till the end of our panel discussion. Uh, so I will open the, the floor for questions. Thank you so uh, much, uh, Alan yeah, Tucson, Lucas, Rezeg, and uh, Evelyn for such a uh, wonderful uh, panel. Uh, and I think um, this will add value for the people who has listened to this. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience that has been placed in the start. Uh, and I think uh, people will be asking uh, all the questions in the main chat. Okay, so you can answer, uh, you, you all three should answer the question on the main chat. But uh, thank you so much for the panel discussion. Uh, now we will be moving to our next presentations. Okay, Lucas, thank you so much for chairing the event. And Ellen, thank you so much for such an insightful presentation, insightful knowledge that you have shared with us. And same goes to Evelyn Ecker. Okay, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank Have you. a nice day. Have Bye. a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.